Interestingly enough, is a, has been a missionary for seven years in the former Soviet Union, and we have worked there with her and at other times uh, through the years. In any case, maybe I should say this, that the one on your left, the oldest girl and her husband, are going to be in Buswanga uh, scuba diving, and some weeks ago invited us to come with them. And we decided we would do that, or meet them, and in order to salve my conscience, I said to Neva, we can't just go over there and play. We need to do something worthwhile. <laughs> so I called up our dear friends, the Bransons, whose uh, her sister is a professor in the School of Nursing here. And uh, so we're, we've worked here for a week. We're going to meet our uh, daughter and her husband on Sunday, and we'll play for a week. But this topic is an epidemic in your country as well as mine. You can have diabetes for many years, actually, and not even know it, although the entire time damages, tissue is being damaged all over one's body. Now, I've seen a number of different figures uh, for this country. In the United States currently, one person out of 11 has type 2 diabetes. You probably know that there's four kinds, if you will, of diabetes, but type 2 diabetes is far and away the most prevalent thing. Uh, the others are all small in comparison. I'll show you some figures. What I found, uh, by the way, it's going to be down to one person out of four in the United States. And the same thing I was surprised to find is happening here. When I looked up the figures, I was astonished. I sort of had the picture in my mind. We have many Filipino friends from the States. One of them, a couple of them, a couple and two of them, if you wish, worked in one of the restaurants we opened in Seattle, Washington for 10 years. But in, in spite of the fact that Neva and I have visited many countries doing classes like this, first time to the Philippines. So I was looking up. I couldn't believe it. 42,000 men die every year in this country from cardiovascular disease. And of course, you may know that diabetes is one of the big issues with cardiovascular disease. 40, uh, 26,000 females die every year in this country from cardiovascular disease. So these modern diseases are terrifying, really, in what's happening in any Western country. Now, <clears throat> one in seven, and that didn't stay long enough at this point, according to the data I looked up, have di diabetes. And when I say diabetes, I mean type 2. If it's something else, I'll uh, refer to it as type 1 or other forms. But the but the, the gentleman who became the first champion of how lifestyle could affect chronic diseases was actually a physician in Hawaii. And he saw these people who were long-term residents there sick. And he saw the people coming from various countries, especially Asian countries, uh, were healthy. Japanese people and others. Uh, and he he was puzzled over this same uh, genetic genetics, if you will, but uh, vast differences in their illness and in their death rates. He was the father, really, of the lifestyle change movement in the world, which sort of moved to the United States. Uh, before long, he was practicing medicine here. But this is his opinion. 100% of type 2 diabetes is preventable. Maybe that wouldn't be all that surprising to you. This is the amazing fact that he says, and I can vouch for this, so I'll tell you why, that 100% of type 2 diabetes is what? Reversible. My wife and I have carried on, or maybe I should say this, um, I'm not a physician, I'm a scientist, but in my graduate work in public health, actually a number of the physicians were there were already friends of mine, but I had this association with 
uh, over 40 physicians who were interested in lifestyle issues and what we would call Western diseases, chronic diseases. So through the years, I have been a guest lecturer with about 30 physicians at Weimar Institute. I, how many of you know about Weimar Institute by any chance? Uh, 20 of you. It's a lifestyle change program that's been operated in Northern California since 1978. And uh, it's remarkable what happens. The greatest tragedy is you teach people how to get well and maybe while they're with you, they get well, but after paying $6,500 to attend Weimar for 18 days, only one out of 10 people go home and stay on the program long-term. It is a heartbreak. And uh, my wife and I, because of that pathway, have conducted numerous six-day programs around the world, many in the US here and there. But it was our dream when we retired to have our own program. So we bought 40 acres and we built some cottages and we have conducted 54 six-day programs on our property since I retired after working for the church for 40 years. I'm gonna tell you just one story. I'd like to tell you stories all evening. But recently in a six-day program, a pastor from the other side of the state came to our place. He was overweight. His blood pressure was off the charts. That's a, of course, that's a metaphor. And his blood sugar was off the charts. And he had peripheral neuropathy. I suppose most of you have heard that term. It usually starts in the hands and the feet. That's why it's regarded peripheral. And people lose the feeling. Uh, he could not feel anything from his knees on down. So you're kind of like walking on stilts or something. It must have felt strange. Am I, am I too loud? Not loud enough? Is that loud enough? Nobody said yes, but that's okay. <clears throat> have you been able to hear me all right? Okay. Now, uh, do not misunderstand this. The average physician will tell his or her patients if they're diagnosed with diabetes and have peripheral neuropathy that it will never get better. It will just get worse. And it's the truth, in America anyway, because even though you teach people how to live wisely, even though you give them medications, uh, it's the case. It seldom improves. My wife and I have seen the opposite, however. Uh, for 15 years, I was a guest lecturer with the Weimar physicians on an off-campus three-day program to reverse diabetes. And at the beginning, we would ask them, how many of you have symptoms of neuropathy? Maybe 80% of the people some tingling in their feet or hands, or worse, often much worse. After only 48 hours on a whole plant regimen, now we called it a three-day program, it was parts of three days, but it was 48 hours. We would ask them just before they left, how many of you have seen some improvement in your neuropathy? And about 70 to 80 percent who had said they had neuropathy in how many days? Two days had improvement. What do we need to do here? Uh, whatever you say. Hello. <laughs> Shall I repeat all of that? No. Anyway, this pastor came to our six-day program that we operate on our property there in northeastern Washington State. He walked into the class. They come on Sunday. We feed them a meal Sunday night. And then the rest of the week, two meals a day. He came into, my, into the classroom on Tuesday morning. 
So how long has he been there? Sunday afternoon, Monday afternoon. He's been there a day and a half. And he, he said this question to me as people are coming in for the lecture. He said, and, and notice the inflection. He said, my neuropathy is getting better? And I said, I'm not surprised. Friday, Thursday afternoon, he came to the classroom. Only two more, three more lectures left before we give people a sack lunch and send them home. And this is what he said. My neuropathy is completely gone. In how many days? Four and a half or so. It's remarkable, friends. We see this all the time. Even though the average physician in America will tell their patients the neuropathy will never get better. Sadly enough. Uh, this is an a, a artist's conception of capillary flow. The only thing that's wrong with it is today we know that the red blood cells have to fold in half to get through. Uh, we name these things differently when they're tiny enough. This is a highly magnified picture, as you doubtless know. When the artery is tiny enough, after enough branching, we call it an arteriole, and suddenly it breaks into 10, 20, 30 or more capillaries. A couple of interesting things here. Can you see the sphincter around that one? And this one? and this one which is relaxed, and there is a sphincter around that one, there's always at least one capillary that does not have a sphincter. So if something happened uh, in whatever manner to close down a lot of capillaries, there's always some blood that can flow. But here's the issue. This is an actual photograph of a capillary coming out of the screen and cut off. You know that's what we call a cross-section. And what we have here, it's about a 10 million uh, X uh, increase in size or magnification. This is what they call the basement membrane. And then there is a cellular lining in the capillary. I think you can see uh, the division between one cell and the next. So here's another cell representing the lining. And I don't tell most people that that L stands for the lumen. Most, a lot of you young people are appraised uh, enough to know, we use that as a describing a passageway in a vessel in the body. Here's the problem. When the average blood sugar is elevated, the average, it's very important to get that point, the basement membrane thickens. What does that do to the lumen now? It's reduced. Virtually every symptom, every problem that diabetics face medically. Now there can be other conditions that might cause other problems. But virtually every one of them is caused by the poor circulation that's caused by this thickening of the basement membrane. The amazing thing is, friends, as I shared with you, how rapidly that can change. Roy Swank, a neurologist from the Oregon Medical School in Portland, studied hamsters. He shaved their cheek, anesthetized them, and put a light bulb in their mouth and a tube to their stomach. And he fastened them down so he could get a microscope right up to that cheek and he could see the capillary blood flow. And it was normal. I actually have the videos of this that he made years ago that far back. The videos weren't the greatest quality, so I don't really often show them, but it, it's, it's absolutely clear. You can see the red blood cells just racing through the capillaries and some of the other structures nearby, if, if there's a, 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 an arteriole or even a vein. But uh, he, then he gives them a, a, a fat, a high-fat meal through that tube. And within just two or three hours, the red blood cells are clumping and sluggishly moving. Now, that was done on hamsters. It turns out people do the same things. Many of you in this room are probably eating too much fat. 
and within two or three hours after that meal, your circulation is compromised all over your body. Now, here's an interesting diagram. This is just a drawing, of course. Red blood cells, you may not know this, are electrically charged. So they repel each other, which the Creator designed. A high-fat meal, not to mention a high-fat regimen over time, causes the electric charge to be neutralized and then the red blood cells clump together. That's the mechanism that was taking place in the hamsters as well as in you and me if we happen to do that. The four types of diabetes we usually think of, type 1 diabetes occurs mainly in children. I'd love to take more time to describe it, but I think I'm going to just leave that for the moment, a fairly small percentage. There is wonderful hope for those, for those kids. It's occurring more and more in adults in America. I didn't look it up for the Philippines, but it's becoming an issue. Do we need any more help with the sound? Or are we doing all right? Okay. <laughs> Type 2 diabetes is the big issue. It's a lifestyle disease. 95% of the diabetes in America and in the Philippines is type 2. Gestational diabetes is quite treatable. There was one study, I won't use both hands, but the study did. If you had women do this for 10 minutes, three times a day, it was enough activity to normalize their blood sugar, uh, which is quite remarkable if you think about it. Some of these women are, I don't know if they're pregnant, but they're trying it. <laughs> <clears throat> Diabetes insipidus, damage to the pituitary gland, which you probably know is straight across here and here. Uh, normally by a tumor, the, the pituitary gland is involved with every hormone in the body. And so it affects the control of insulin. And it's quite rare, but quite rare, but it is a type of diabetes that is described in the literature. Now, this is a new one. And I'm going to show you something that's absolutely astonishing and frightening. But today we are starting to call Alzheimer's disease type 3 diabetes. It is not yet in the medical literature, but everyone knows it's coming. And it's because of what we call insulin resistance and the tragedy of a long-term exposure above normal in our whole circulation, but particularly, of course, the brain. The number one risk factor for uh, Alzheimer's disease is diabetes, and we didn't know the mechanism until quite recently. <clears throat> so that's the big issue. The complications are numerous, poor circulation, increase in cardiovascular disease, stroke. Number one cause of blindness in adults is type 2 diabetes. Anybody know what the number one cause of blindness in children is? Accidents. But for adults, it's diabetes. Amputations. I'm sorry I didn't look this up. I'll just tell you for America. In America, we amputate 235 legs every day because of diabetes. And the amazing thing is, it is completely preventable even after it manifests uh, as a wound that will not heal, and there's an issue with gangrene, even, even on the horizon, if not happening, uh, as soon as you put those people on a whole plant regimen, now I don't know if you use that term, I'm not talking, I'm not talking vegan, you can be a junk food vegan, I mean, after all, aren't French fries and potato chips junk? I mean, aren't, aren't they junk food? Are they vegan? Yeah. So we don't use the word vegan. We, we say whole plant. And what we mean is unrefined. Now, there's a little exception. Sweetening things enough to make them palatable, even with refined sugar, in my humble opinion, is not a problem.
you might want to throw me out of the room for that. But you could use honey, you could use ma maple syrup and so forth. It's all glucose, friends. And uh, to make something palatable in uh, my wife's kitchen, uh, we do use some refined sugar, not very much. A kidney failure, number one cause, diabetes, premature death, peripheral neuropathy, gastroparesis is neuropathy of the nerves that make the stomach do this and this. So stomachs don't empty well when there's uh, gastroparesis from diabetes. Infections, cataracts, gangrene, hypertension, larger babies, because there's more fuel in the, in the, in the mother's vessels, right? Uh, increased glucose, premature birth, and all the problems that it brings, as well as ulcers. Many years ago, we used to diagnose diabetes with uh, 140 milligrams per deciliter. Now, you use different units in this country, and I forgot. I know, when I'm overseas, I normally put those in the slides, but nevertheless, you can get the point here. Uh, about 30 years ago, that was reduced to 125. So suddenly, there was a whole lot more people that had diabetes just because they moved, which they did wisely. They could see that uh, 140 was too late, sort of, you know, so. Uh, and the first time they ever had something called prediabetes was about 30 years ago when this was done. And by the way, if you talk to any informed physician in this world, uh, prediabetes is diabetes. It's kind of a, a false idea that, oh, you're okay, you only have prediabetes. It's not the case. It is, it is diabetes. Current diagnosis, hemoglobin A1c, uh, prediabetes, I'm not sure I'll have time this evening. I would love to take a few minutes telling you why it is that hemoglobin A1c is the gold standard, friends, for diagnosing diabetes. Uh, it's just remarkable how this thing has surfaced. We've only known about this maybe 25 years at the most, I guess, uh, but we use this to diagnose diabetes <clears throat> today. I'm going to pass this up quickly. I mentioned it. Uh, if you, if you probably know this, if someone who has type 1 diabetes, and it usually occurs in children, if they will carefully administer insulin because their body isn't making any, that's a whole story. How in the world did the beta cells, uh, which make insulin in the pancreas, how in the world did they get all destroyed? We think we know, uh, and maybe I'll get a chance to talk about it in a minute, in, for a minute, but nevertheless, if they're real careful, it doesn't, it doesn't matter so much what they eat. I mean, it should be wise, but the point is how much insulin for what they ate. And if they are careful with those calculations, they, they theoretically could do just as well as, as you and I do. In practice, the average person with type 2 diabetes lives about 10 years less than someone else with the other conditions being the same. Now, the culprit is not a virus. For many years, we did not know in the scientific community what was causing this. What's actually causing it is cow's milk. And again, I wish I had more time to describe this, but all of you smart college students will get this quickly. I have to take a long time with an ordinary audience to make this clear. For some children, there is a genetic mutation that causes a protein to be manufactured. I presume you all, all you college kids know that we don't use any proteins as such. Our body cuts them up into amino acids and every cell in your body, with one exception, red blood cells, makes the proteins you need when and where you need them. Are you all with me on that? How many, how many of you know that? Can I see your hands? Whoa, you know it now. How many? <laughs> okay. So, and, and, and I, maybe you don't know this. The function of a gene, the scientists like to use big words, is to code for a specific protein. That is to say, the gene has the information for the cell in your body, every cell except red blood, to make certain proteins, a certain protein. And a mutation, even one base pair, are you okay with base pair? one of the rungs in the ladder that is our DNA. Three billion, two hundred million rungs. 
just one base pair being incorrect, we call it a mutation, will change the shape of the protein that that gene codes for. You with me so far? And proteins are able to do a job because of their shape. And just one amino acid in the wrong place, or the wrong one in that place, will change the shape of that protein in some manner so that it cannot function as well. Usually just one, the amino must still work, but not so good. And in any case, uh, there are some people, children, because this usually uh, shows itself pretty quickly in the life of the person, there is a genetic mutation which causes a protein to be displayed on the beta cell. Are you all aware of the fact that our cells are just covered with proteins, receptors and various kinds of controls and on and on? So this mutation causes a protein to be displayed on the beta cell that is very similar to cow's milk protein. And when the child you don't know this about a child. I suppose the day is coming when they're going to be scanning possibly what they would consider at-risk children to sequence their DNA or at least that one place, and that's quite possible today. You can go into a lab today and they can pick out a gene and tell you, oh, there's a couple of mutations in your body in that gene. Fairly straightforward right there in the lab. They don't have to send it off to do a PCR uh, to get you know, information on at least some of the... Some of the uh, base pairs. In any case, uh, the body recognizes that protein on the beta cell as foreign and destroys the beta cells. Got it? Sad situation. Now, it turns out that Weimar Institute has learned, and, and you should take this home, that if you catch a child who is being di has been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes or can see that it's progressing quickly, if you get that child quickly enough on a whole plant regimen, you can halt the destruction. So I tell people, some, you know a person or you have a child or a grandchild, call the medical director at Weimar and get that kid down there as fast as you can and go with them to learn what needs to be learned. Type 2 diabetes, once called it onset. I don't like the NIDM term, but you can use it if you want, just because it's so many big words. And uh, you already know this, complications for all of them. Two completely different diseases. A, a fellow by the name of Jim Anderson, who is still alive, I have listened to him a number of times. He's a widely respected nutritionist. He's retired now. This may surprise you. He did a study. I'll show you the date. I think it was 1976 that he did this study. He fed people with diabetes a what diet? High carb? Doesn't everybody know that carbs are bad for you? And he was able to get them well. He was the first person that ever studied this issue and saw this. Uh, this is the citation if you're interested. Uh, he was able to discontinue insulin therapy in nine of the patients who were getting up to 20 units and in two patients who were getting up to 32 units. No more insulin, and they were well from their diabetes. Amazing story. Highly respected nutritionist, this man. And you can still uh, listen to him on YouTube. Uh, he's still living, at least the last I checked. Uh, and this is amazing. A 53-point drop in cholesterol, blood serum cholesterol, in just 16 days. I have a story behind that I can't take the time to tell as much as I would love to. Now, I want you to listen to this. I think I can make it work pretty well. This is Dr. Caldwell Eselston, who wrote the book, How to Reverse Heart Disease. This is amazing, friends. He's highly respected physician and researcher from Cornell. Uh, I know him personally. We have talked a number of times about his studies. He has sent me personally some of the results. And uh, 
This is what he said in a recent film. You might be interested to write this down either on your phone or in your mind. The name of this film is Eating You Alive. Eating You Alive. How many of you have ever heard of the film or saw it Forks Over Knives? Not so many. Eating You Alive is 10x. <laughs> it's just absolutely outstanding. And he is one of about a dozen physicians that all teach what I'm saying. The whole plant regimen is what you and I need to be on. And I know that's hard for people in your country. You've lived by the seas all your lives and you get all, a lot of food from there. But it turns out, it's amazing, friends, how many of the Western diseases are curtailed, healed on a whole plant regimen. You gotta be active too. Uh, it's an important part, but everybody pretty knows that. Here's what uh, Dr. Ezelston is saying. I guess I better turn the volume on first. Try it again. Well, injures. Got to turn it up some more. Okay, here we go. Oil injures endothelial cells. Olive oil, corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower, oil, coconut oil, palm oil, oil in a cracker, oil in bread, oil in a salad dressing. The coconut oil miracle is that it's still on the market. And so when we just hear little clips on the news, maybe on the internet, says olive oil's the way to go, we grab onto that. And unfortunately, it's bad information. Everybody says, well, gosh, Dr. Esselstyn, it's so hard. Aren't they gonna have some of these places have oil? Yeah, all of them. When the waiter or the waitress comes to your table, you turn in your seat, take your glasses off, look them squarely in the eye. <clears throat> you must understand that I am deathly allergic to a single drop of any oil. Now, you get creative. You will lose weight. You will lose your high blood pressure. You will lose your diabetes. You will feel better. You will lose your risk for stroke. You will lose your risk for dementia. So, there are side effects. <laughs> Pretty remarkable, wouldn't you say? I don't know if you've ever heard this before, friends, but in America, probably I think it's the same here, as I've been talking to people about this, Americans have learned that olive oil is good for you. Have you heard that? Good for your heart? What did the physician just say about that? He said it's bad information. There's about 12 to 15 physicians, a couple of them are Adventists, in this film, Eating You Alive. I think three of them are. Uh, they all agree with this. And it's unknown among Adventists largely, but these oils, friends, are refined. You understand that. As soon as you take that molecule of fat out of the plant, it starts oxidizing. It is now technically a free radical. You know about that. Is it good or bad? It's bad. In fact, I don't know if you know this, that free radical is a carcinogen. That good? That's bad news. And uh, so what these physicians are teaching and what me, Weimar has taught for many, many years is that we don't use any refined oils. You say, how would I cook? I'm not trying to sell Mrs. Brackett's cookbook. I, re I mean that. But... Uh, She's a very humble woman. She doesn't like me to say this. You go a long, long, long way before you find somebody with as many years of experience as she has in making healthy food taste delicious. Uh, you talk to anybody that's ever eaten at her table and they'll tell you the food is fabulous. We have been following what I'm preaching here for 55 years. And, and God has blessed her, and I get to eat all this good food she makes. <laughs> what did Esselstyn say? You would uh, 
lose weight. Maybe some of you are interested in that. You lose your risk for hypertension. This is all because of what, friends? Stopping the use of refined oils. Are you all with me? And you'll never find a better authority than Els Caldwell Eselstyn. The guy's respected everywhere in the world. Uh, you'll feel better. You lose your diabetes. You lose your risk for stroke. You lose your risk, whoa, for what? You young kids don't even think about this yet because you're so young. You wait till you're 80, then you'll think about it, right? All right. Amazing stuff, friends. It's really amazing. Now, let me show you what uh, is really going on here. What I have on the horizontal axis is time. Let's say 10 to 15 years. And on the vertical axis, how much insulin is found in your blood. So even though this fluctuates a little bit, th this amount of insulin right here, I'm not even putting a figure. I want you to get the concept. You eat a meal, it goes up a bit. Fasting, it goes down a bit. But the idea, this is the average. You all with me on that? Just a, just a line there. Here's what happens as people are not living wisely. The amount of insulin that the body is producing is increasing in order to control the blood sugar over time. This could be 10 years, sometimes more. Finally, and we don't understand all we would like to know about this, the pancreas fatigues. I'm not sure that's the best word, but the beta cells cannot keep up with the increasing demand, the dotted line. Actually, some of the beta cells die. We're pretty clear on that. And what happens is they just can't make that much insulin. And only after this point in time would you be diagnosed with an elevated blood sugar. Are you all with me on what I'm trying to describe? Here's the terrible news. We hope we've only known this for several years, like I say. All this time, from when this starts till however when this is, maybe 10 or 15 years later, our brain is exposed to all this extra insulin measured on the vertical axis. Are you all with me on that? And it, it's just becoming as clear as can be. This is what is causing dementia. And even though a lot of you are pretty young, you could already be doing this. Too much exposure to insulin all through the body, right? And of course, the brain, because the blood is everywhere. <clears throat> so a very serious issue going on here. Now, uh, I'm sorry, this, this was probably made for people much less intelligent or informed than you are, but I'm going to show it to you anyway. What we have here is a cell membrane. Most of you young people are aware that the cell is a bilipid layer. The cell membrane is. That's, uh, th these, these are, these are uh, uh, the, like a triglycer only, it, only it's a diglyceride with the two tails. And so the cell membrane is two layers of this. And the, it's a cartoon, really. I'm going to play the video momentarily. Um, and this red thing, this represents an insulin receptor. And this little tail represents a chemical pathway for a signal, which I'll describe here. I'm going to turn off the volume because I'm going to start and stop it in, rather than letting Neil Bernard tell the story. For those of you that are Mac users, I've got to remember to press the K and not the arrow or it starts all over again. Here we go. So there's the cell membrane and accumulating right under, especially in the muscle cells, right under the cell uh, membrane, fat particle isn't really correct. They're fatty acids, but it, for the average layperson, you can say it's a fat particle. And these fatty acids are accumulating there in excess because of a high fat diet or just too much fat. And what happens is when the insulin receptor attaches to an insulin molecule, which is a protein, by the way, very complex protein, actually. There is a signal, 
It's a chemical signal. But for the lay people out there, the people who wrote this cartoon, they just pretend like there's a ball. But you understand it's a chemical signal, right? And what happens is that signal is blocked by the excess of fatty acids just under the cell membrane. So the body um, cannot get sugar from the blood into the cell. Now there's another gadget down here. Um, I don't think I can point to it because it'll make the thing start. For lay people, I call it a sugar grabber. For you, I'm going to tell you it's a glucotranslocator. <laughs> and what happens is uh, the signal is blocked, but if you clear those fatty acids, which it turns out you can do in about 24 hours on guess what kind of a regimen? Say it with me. Whole plant. Astonishing. The uh, concentration of these fatty acids is decreased. The signal is recognized. Watch, watch this cartoon picture of the thing. And the sugar pours into the cell from the bloodstream, thus doing what to the blood sugar? Lowering it, see. Amazing story that we only have known quite recently. Too many calories, especially when they're from fat. Let me give you an interesting comparison. Let's take three ounces of several foods. Bacon. I'm sorry to tell you this. Potato chips or corn chips. Would you like to raise your right hand and repeat after me? I promise to stop using <clears throat> uh, listen, I don't know if it's the, this is this case in, in the Philippines. In America, Americans think that potatoes are fattening. It's insanity. It's what they put in the crack that's the problem. The potato itself is... Uh, let me back up and just remind you that sugar is perfect fuel for the cell. Because when you burn sugar, you make three things. Water, carbon dioxide, and energy. No smoke in the chimney. You understand what I'm trying to say? Okay. Some are nodding. Some are looking at me like... It's the most beautiful thing, friends. Now, I'm not saying you should use refined sugar for fuel. But carbohydrate, by definition, is strings of sugar molecules. Are you with me on that? And if that sugar comes from a whole plant regimen, it is perfect fuel for the cell. Perfect fuel. When you burn, there's only three things you can burn for energy, fat, carbohydrate, protein. When you burn carbo, uh, fat and protein, you make smoke in the chimney. You know what that smoke is called? Ketones. What's the big fad diet in America today? Is it the same here? The keto diet? It's insanity. It's like you're destroying your body. Does it change the sugar a little bit? Yes, but it's just a crazy idea. But Americans don't want to, they don't want to make changes that change what they love. So anything that comes along that lets them do something that they would like to do, they, they jump right at it. Certainly not the Filipinos, they're much smarter. Look at three ounces of potato. Is the potato fattening? No. What about bread? People think bread is fattening. No, it's what you put on it. What, look at broccoli just for fun or many of the plants would fall in that later category. All right. So this is the organelle where uh, sugar burned is a metaphor. It is not burned. You, many of you college kids know there's a sequence of chemical steps that take place to extract the energy from the sugar molecule or fat and protein, which is fine if there's just not too much of it. That's the organelle where this is accomplished. And uh, when I say sugar is a perfect fuel, I don't mean this, or this, or this. Of course, the banana is pretty good. This is what I'm talking about. Is that sweet? What about this? Wonder Listen, folks, I shouldn't take your time. 
I'm going to tell you a story. Can you stand a story? Say yes. One of my major professors, wonderful fellow, taught us biochemistry in graduate school, uh, learned from the literature that there was a tribe in South America that were getting 97% of their calories from sweet potatoes. And he thought, ah, perfect place to go show them, show the students how to help people do better. So the, he flies them all down there and they pitch their tents and get their computers and they start watching these people. They write, you know how it is, they write down everything they do, which is a little strange, but that's what you have to do sometimes. Um, and they couldn't find anything wrong, except one of the students after two or three days said, wait a minute, they're not drinking any water. And sure enough, they weren't. Well, let's show them they need to drink water. How are we going to do that? Let's test their urine with our little densitometers we brought along. Of course, the natives, they, they, they cooperated. And you know what? Their urine was about the same as distilled water. Why didn't they need to drink a lot of water? They were eating an almost pure starch diet. 97% of their calories from a potato-like substance. I'm not ex telling you you should quit drinking water. Don't, don't miss that. But I just want you to see how powerful it is, folks, when the carbohydrate is from whole plants. It's wonderful food for us. Wonderful food in so many different ways. They packed up their bags and went home. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't tell those people anything. That's, I love that story. Excuse, excuse me for taking the time. And here's some more. Ah, look at that, folks. And this. And that. Ooh. Are legumes high in starch? Yes, high in starch. Wonderful food. By the way, there's 16,000 varieties of legumes on the planet. So if you don't like lentils, like I don't, is that okay? Say yes, because you have 15,999 other options to choose from, right? All right. In any case, you'll find this on page 17, I think it is, in our cookbook. That ice cream on that waffle is made should I quit walking on those wires? I, okay, I'll try, to, I'll try to behave and stay where I belong. That ice cream is made, follow me, cashew nuts, coconut milk, uh, some sugar, help me dear, what am I missing? A little guar, a little guar gum, that's it. Um, and. We sold this ice cream at Five Loaves Deli and Bakery, a restaurant we operated in Seattle for 10 years. It was part of a ministry, like you have near here. We were, we were visiting there today. And uh, we, sold, we actually bought a soft serve machine. You know what I mean? Pull the handle and get all this ice cream. And, but we put our own mix in it. And, uh, and the waffle, just for example, that waffle is a pretty rich pastry, if you think about it, eggs, uh, usually white flour and uh, oil, thank you, dear. But we make it out of pretty much just pure uh, oatmeal, oat flakes, and uh, we put a raisin in there so the waffle turns brown in the waffle iron. And what else, dear? Oh, yes, yes, a little bit of corn flour. Okay. Anyway, uh, one of those wonderful things. So high carb, low fat, low protein. I don't know if you know this, folks. You eat a lot of protein, even from plants. It'd be pretty hard, except refined plants. And it's bad for your kidneys. Did you know that? It's bad for your bones. And if it's animal protein, it's even worse because it increases heart disease. Just because it's animal protein. Just because there's some sulfur amino acids. More sulfur amino acids in, in animal protein than in plant proteins, and we think that's probably the mechanism that's causing uh, more problems there. Uh, you don't need to worry about that. I don't think I'll trip. Uh, from unrefined plants. <clears throat> um, this is the ketones that are formed. I won't read them to you, but it's bad news, folks, to make to, to have all this fat and protein in our diet. And I'm not sure I should waste your time on this, but that red tank is a, is a fuel tank. It's actually two tanks, oxygen and hydrogen. And the reason there's twice as much hydrogen as oxygen, you know this, is because you're going to make water when you burn that hydrogen. 
and of course, uh, that's fine for people too, actually, to uh, get carbon with it. It's now a carbohydrate. You get carbon dioxide and water and energy, as I said uh, a few minutes ago, so we don't need to take any more time with that. Um, I'll close with this, even though I'd like to keep you longer. Let's suppose I take this ear of corn, and I'm talking about the kernels that you eat. Actually, there's one other thing I will do. I, I really need to do one more thing, but let's remove all the carbohydrate, all the protein, all the vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals and fiber. What's left? I didn't hear it. You need a microphone. <laughs> I'll tell you what it is. It's fat. Do people make corn oil? Sure. Very popular. Uh, you might be interested to know that it will take 14 years of corn to make one tablespoon of oil. And you know what? I think you need that tablespoon of oil when you eat 14 years of corn. I'm not saying you have to eat 14 years of corn at once. <laughs> now, a tablespoon of oil is about 100 calories, plus or minus, depending on the oil, or slight differences, not much. Let's take a pretty good-sized potato, a little bigger than you'd normally serve on a plate, 200 calories. Let's cut it up and make potato chips. And in that bag, it's a family bag, there's a thousand calories. And you tell me what are the ingredients that are listed on the back of that bag. Go ahead and say it out loud. Are you saying corn? Not saturated fat. Um, they would normally use a, well, I'll just tell you. It's going to tell you on the back, potatoes, oil, and salt. Correct? And the bag has 2,000, uh, has 1,000 calories, and 200 came from a potato. So where did the other 800 calories come from? A smidgens from protein, perhaps. And uh, 800 calories are going to come from the oil that was added to that. Uh, so there's the 200, and there's the 800 calories of coming from oil. You all with me so far? 100 calories per tablespoon, and it's going to take eight tablespoons to make up the 1,000 calories that's in the bag. All right. How many ears of corn would that be? 14 for each tablespoon. Let's see, about 112 ears. You need that eight tablespoons of oil when you do what? Eat 112 ears of corn. You see how we get this thing so backwards? Uh, and so damaging to ourselves. Listen, I love potatoes. You've never done this. I, one time I ate a whole bag of them all at once myself. You've never done that, have you? She won't answer me. <laughs> all right. I think you get the point, friends. Uh, and if you stop and think about it, folks, what we're really talking about is a Garden of Eden diet. Isn't that right? Did they have uh, oil extraction plants in the Garden of Eden? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. Uh, and I'll tell you what, my dear wife, uh, you, you ought to come. I'll tell you what, if you fly to the United States, you call us up and you can come to our house and spend a day and a night there and she'll feed you free. I'm serious. You do it. And I'll make you some ice cream, too. <laughs> okay. Um, let me take a look here at one last thing. Here's the story. Damage to the tissue as blood sugar increases. This is actually measured in the retina. This is no damage. This is a lot. In other words, the vertical scale is damage. 
and this is the A1C, or you can just understand this as increasing blood sugar, in case you're not familiar with how that works. And um, this is where we put uh, the numbers these days, so that this is uh, pre-diabetes, and this is the beginning of diabetes, and so forth. Now, one day, this is my closing story. Dr. McCann and I and Dr. Fritz were holding a reversing diabetes program. Let me get my remote. In back east, uh, near Washington, D.C. We had about 50 people. And Dr. Fritz showed up. This is common today. You can get him for $100. But he showed up with a device. You had to get a, a blood... A, a, blood prick, and uh, it would give you the A1C in about three, four minutes. $10,000 in the beginning. You can get them today for 100 So he began checking all the guests. Everybody be nice to know what their A1C is at the moment. By the way, it doesn't change quickly. It doesn't change over just one meal or two. So it's a very good measure, as, as I was saying earlier. And after he had checked all the guests, he started checking the staff. It was about seven of us. Three of us do lectures, and the others are selling books and whatever. And I thought to myself, I don't want to embarrass the cause. I have a, a dessert at every meal, and it might mess up. So I went over to the corner and tried to act like I was busy doing something way over there out of sight. And my dear friend Jim McCann, bless his heart, um, I told you we went to graduate school together on nutrition. And uh, in any case, just a wonderful guy, just a great guy. And so his, he's a runner. He like runs 30 to 40 miles a week. And I don't like running. I work hard. We have 40 acres to take care of. And uh, anyway, he, was, he had the lowest uh, A1C of anybody among the whole staff, or certainly in the room. And, and all of a sudden, he saw me over in the corner. And he said, hey, check Jim's. His will be lower than mine. And I thought, yeah. So I guess you could say I was stuck. But you know what my A1C turned out to be? Isn't that amazing? Amazing. And it's because Jim and Carolyn, precious friends, um, he knew he wasn't, he and his wife were not as careful as Neva and I were. Even though I kind of thought, I'm not so sure I'll be any better. I thought I'd be worse because of all those desserts we eat and all that ice cream on our waffles every Sunday morning. Anyway, um, I hope you're inspired to do something better. And this, this is my real appeal, friends. God has designed, and this you got to be careful with this because it's fraught with so much baggage. God has designed that the health message would be the entering wedge to reach people around us. Are you all with me on that? And you kids, and a few older folks, but you kids are all young and healthy. It doesn't matter what you eat, you're still healthy. But... Uh, I appeal to you to say to the Lord, I want to take care of my body the way you would like me to and help me to help others. The problem is, folks, there are kind of people that just don't understand and they're kind of mean. That's not fair. But they become a little obnoxious telling us what we should and should not eat. Do you understand what I'm talking about? But let's not be like that, right? Let's be thoughtful and kind. Invite somebody to our invite somebody to your home for a meal, but don't tell them it's healthy food. Right? If they like it real well, say, we'll come back next Sunday and we'll have ice cream on waffles again. Right? You understand what I'm talking about. I don't want to make fun of this, folks, but it's a problem, isn't it? I think it's not quite so much of a problem today as it used to be, but people are kind of they become health fanatics and they become kind of mean. Let's not do that. And let's pray together that God 
will bless us in trying to do better for ourselves and help others. Father, I am so thankful for your love and your patience and your mercy. I thank you for this beautiful campus and the young people and the professors that are here and other people, adjunct and whatever uh, the responsibilities are. Bless this place, Lord, and may it be a place that inspires all of us to take care of our bodies and be a blessing to other people. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I meant to tell you I was comfortable with questions. Uh, maybe later this weekend. I don't, right in the middle of I'm talking, if you just raise your hand, or, and we can do some Q&A at the end. In fact, if somebody wants to hang around, I'll hang around a few minutes, but we'll see you tomorrow. If you are compelled and inspired tonight, would you please say amen to what Pastor Brackett had said. Okay, to be honest, my family, uh, my family's medical history is on diabetes. And I'm so glad that there is such program who, uh, which made me realize how important my health is and that diabetes can be reversed and it is preventive. Now, I have four key takeaways tonight before I give them the chance to ask questions. The very first one, which I already told, is that diabetes is reversible and preventable. The second one is the ideal diet for me, for all of us, to have um, low carb, a high carb, low fat, and low protein from plant-based diet. I'm really glad I learned that. And the third one, which made me realize that I should not be really dependent on internet because olive oil is said to be the best type of oil to use in the kitchen, but it's misconception and it's, um, it's not true, right? So, who wants to throw the first question tonight? I think we have a minute or two or more. How many minutes, Ma'am Nati? Five. Five minutes. Yeah. Anyone from the students, college students who are here with us? Ladies? I think they, they are from the College of Health. Am I right? College of Nursing. Are there? And College of? Only two. Nursing, yes. Okay. I'd like to throw the first question. Anyone? Don't be shy. We should have announced early this evening before we started that if you are a shy type person, you may just jot down the question on a piece of paper probably and give it to the, to the facilitator. Okay, we can do that tomorrow. But I have a very short one. Ah, yes. Yes, ma'am. What's the alternatives? The goal is not, is not to use any oil free. Every, listen friends, every single plant on the face of the earth has oil in it. And we should get all the fat we need by simply eating the plants. Now, you're so used to cooking with oil, I understand the problem. But it's not olive oil or some other oil. They are all Oxidized. This, this stuff is terrific. In fact, folks, when you raise, the moment you take that oil out, it's oxidizing. Oxidizing. But when you put it in a frying pan, you, uh, any of you that have taken chemistry will know this. Maybe you never put it together. You increase the oxidation rate by two million times when you raise that up to frying temperature. Did you hear Esselstyn saying, say, oil in a cookie? Oil in bread, no matter where it is, when you heat it, it's way worse than it was before. So we have learned to cook without any oil at all. 
Neva is the, is the author of three whole plant cookbooks. And uh, she's coming forward to speak. Is that correct? Well, I just wanted to say one little thing. Because years ago when we had two, well, we had a restaurant in Seattle that was all plant foods like this, recipes. Owned by the church. The whole thing we did there in Seattle for 10 years was all a conference project. But we had two restaurants. <laughs> But one of uh, our best, our favorite cook there was a Filipino young woman who uh, learned. She didn't know how to cook this way, but she learned and she, we taught her. And she put it into practice so well. And one thing that people loved that she made was uh, pancit. Pancit? <laughs> what do you call it? Pancit. And uh, Ponset. Anyway, um, she made it without oil. And so you probably think, how could you do that? And I wish that I had the recipe. I don't have it. I, I should have included it in our cookbook from the five loaves, but somehow I never uh, did. But I, I'm quite sure that what she did was she sauteed um, onion and carrot and what little you just put these nice little vegetables in with these lovely thin um, noodles, and she would uh, saute them in water and seasonings and flavor that water with all the good flavors that you want to put in your food, and then mix that in with the noodles so that they're juicy. And I think today, we weren't doing this then, but we've gotten a little bit hooked on using coconut milk, not coconut oil. But I think I would saute those vegetables in coconut milk and then uh, stir that in with my um, noodles or whatever vegetables, stir fry vegetables, I often do that way. And it just gives it the feel in your mouth without the Refined oil is just a, uh, you know, a little bit of fat in the coconut milk. Okay, time's up. <laughs> Anybody else, real quick? Not a soul? Okay. I really wish we have more time, but I have one question here, quick question. I think this will be the last. Um, if one has been diagnosed with diabetes 2 and it's reversed, is there a special meal plan? For that? You can build a special meal plan, but the answer is to just eat plants unrefined. And it works. It's just amazing. Uh, Neva, Neva has menus in our cookbook, so you can pick a menu if you want. but. Uh, there's what, there's 200 and almost 30 recipes in that book for plant foods uh, of just about anything you can imagine. Whether, so, uh, all, it doesn't matter, folks, if you only ate potatoes. Just whatever you like, as long as it's cooked without oil. And those, I tell you, folks, I have seen it over and over again at Weimar. I was the boss at Weimar. Neil Nedley asked me to come be the, the vice president for a while till he could move his practice. Um, but I've been a guest lecturer with their physicians, like I say, for many, many years. And it's just amazing, folks. People get well from all kinds of chronic conditions. Uh, diabetes is probably the most significant one because it's, it's becoming a huge problem in Western countries. But anything you make from plants, Fine, just don't cook it in oil. Thank you. I think there's a, an online viewer who wants to ask a question. Yes, Pastor, there's, this is a question from one of our online worshipers, and she asks, how about if the olive oil is used as a salad dressing and is not heated? Now, if it's salad dressing, you're going to eat it. And I'm sorry to say, uh, it, if you want to do this right, you don't use oil in your salad dressings. And Neva has a number of salad dressings made without oil. 
They're delicious. Yeah. That oil, folks, is toxic. It is toxic. And it's killing Americans. We'll look at it more. It's, it's, listen, in case you don't come to any more of my lectures, one final thing I promise. A study was done by very competent scientists where they um, took fat out of people's diet that was saturated or partly saturated and replaced it with plant oil. And there was a, did you follow that? And there was a 56%, 59% decrease in death from cardiovascular disease. Big deal? Absolutely. I'll show you the references. The overall death rate did not change. Want to guess why? Cancer. The oil is causing cancer. The, the study is there. You can't refute it. It's, it's a well done study. So. I'm sorry to tell you all this bad news, but all you got to do is get somebody's cookbook that doesn't use oil. We didn't even bring any. I'm sorry, dear. Yeah, a lot of online. Yeah. Plant based. Whole plant. It's not just plant based, friends. You all with me? Plant based. Is olive oil and all those other oils, are they plant based? <laughs>